Unless we have an infinite regress of bodies where we keep going back, you know, ad infinitum, we're going to have to say that there is something like a point in which there is a kind of fulcrum of knowledge, of pure knowledge, in which, of course, we would have to have a starting point. But this starting point is not, of course, a material point. It's not a point. It's not a chronological point in natural history, in which you know you had like the great 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 grandparents of humanity who actually were wise and they started this process of transmission. There's something that's actually disconnected from the chronological uh, course of history, which is where, and this is the Deleuzian part, right? Like the domain of the forms in which the pure knowledge is sort of like, quote unquote, uh, stored, if you will, and which we then subsequently activate, right? Now, of course, this, this leads to the obvious question, which is the same question that we get in the modern period with regards to, for example, the Cartesian correlation or relation between the mind and the body. How does this domain of immaterial forms in which proper knowledge is stored, right? And the souls that at the end of the day exist um, are able to fully you know, uh, 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 arrive at a state of knowledge, right? Or have been in a state of knowledge. How does this interact with the material world and the chronological world of opinions which is always contaminated and therefore can never be quite pure. Um, and, and that's part of what the doctrine of participation tries to explain, right? And the idea that knowledge in, in, in this world, in this life that we have is never quite complete. It's asymptotic, right? It's a regulative ideal. Wisdom is a regulative ideal. We aspire to it, but insofar as we are incarnate, embodied beings we can never quite get there the best we can hope for is the philosophical life which is just a technique for approximating this state of wisdom which at the end of course which is why socrates is so jolly at the prospect of dying right why he doesn't fear death, because it's what the philosopher has been waiting for all his life and he has lived in accordance with the pursuit of knowledge so that's of course the 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 doctrine right um but it's important to say it can't be historical purely right in the sense that 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 anamnesis and recollection therefore cannot be something that simply pertains to a recollection of something that occurred in past generations in human history or even natural history right history it's this is what i was saying last time there's a certain sense in which this theory is radically not only anti-psychologistic in the sense that we're not recollecting something we at one moment forgot in our pesky little brains of ours, but it's also radically anti-historicist in the sense that the domain from which the knowledge is drawn from, right, what one is recollecting from, where one is recollecting from, is not uh, a point in chronological history, neither natural or cultural or human history, right? It has to be something more, more a time immemorial is the resonance, right? Um, now, there's different ways to read this immemoriality of time. In metaphysical terms, there's, you know, the idea, for example, is mathematics invented or discovered, right? When we discover mathematics, what are we doing, right? We're accessing a truth that is not obviously visible in the strict sense. It's not one more body in the wind. But if it's discovered, they were already there. Well, where are they? If they don't have a spatio-temporal location, right? And if they weren't invented in the course of, uh, you know, natural history or human history, where are they? Mathematical truths, right? This, this question that is very basic about mathematical realism or anti-realism is very much at the heart of what Plato is saying, right? Concerning not only mathematical idealities, entities, but more, more generally abstract entities, including the forms, right? This dialectical, uh, quote unquote, conceptual archetypes. The capacity for rule following, which is uh, at, the, at the heart of sapient intelligence. In other words, the capacity to uh, make inferences on the basis of whatever topic it might be. This is a general capacity, right? That we enjoy as sapient beings. It's it's what defines us as human beings. This is not something that's just, quote unquote, uh, 
is specific to the logocentric Western tradition or something like that, right? It is something that in a certain way conditions the possibility of any sapient organism to be able to acquire a language, whatever language it might be, right? So Sellers is saying that there's this structural pra practical capacity that defines sapient cognition that is completely general and structurally invariant across all of human languages, that irrespective of the historical period, irrespective of the uh, language culture that they happen to inhabit. So if that's the case, then there is a sense in, this, in, the, in the Chomskyan sense in which inference is uh, not properly speaking learned because it's a quote unquote, if you want to call it innate capacity. Not innate in the sense, of course, that we're born immediately able to make inferences, but that in the course of our developmental history, this is something that we enjoy. And therefore, that in fact, inference is the condition for capacity to learn empirically that this or that is, you know, that two plus two equals four, right? Um, so could it be, I, I guess this is your, your suggestion, Aaron, right? That this kind of uh, ability, for example, the ability to to do inferences, right? The structural invariant capacity that that uh, there is a reading of Plato in which there are these kind of capacities that are, you know, the capacity for reasoning, for inferential articulation that are not learned, but simply, quote unquote, uh, structurally invariant, right? And that enable or make possible everything empirical that is, you know, happens to, to be acquired in the course of our lifetimes. Um, I don't think this is what, I mean, yes, I think that there's there's definitely an aspect of this uh, in the Plato reading, especially in the, in, in the, in the way that I'm describing Plato as a, as a kind of proto-inferentialist, because the forms themselves are, the, the inferential relationships of incompatibility and consequence into which the forms enter, right, condition your capacity to be able to identify any kind of particular in the world as entering also in relationships of incompatibility and consequence. So to the extent that the forms are themselves not, you know, simply quote unquote created during the course of human history by arbitrary nominal means, right? And incidentally, this is one of the, the readings of the Cratylus, which we unfortunately didn't have time to read, but th this question of, you know, um, the origins of language and nomination. But, but the point is, it would follow very clearly that this, this inferential articulation between forms is also what is being recollected and what enables you to actually engage in patterns of reasoning that actually manage to represent things in the world, right? Because if, if the forms weren't so inferentially articulated, then our capacity to do inferences wouldn't yield any kind of knowledge. Right? It would it would be floating in the void. There would be no consistency um, to our inferences.